Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager and Otto. Sometimes I don't introduce Otto, and I'll tell you why. I just assume everybody knows him. I need an introduction. Otto needs no introduction. This is the Fireside Chat, complete with Fireside, and I do the chatting. So this is number 222? 223. 223. I always miss by one. Mm -hmm. It's eerie. 223. Before I proceed, I just want to remind you that everything we do is available to people for free. Is that correct? Is everything? Mm -hmm. I thought it was everything. Yeah. And that's a lot of content and we're, we're touching a lot of people. We're, we're trying to make a really big difference uh, in, in America's life and in the West's life. So you can help us by donating. And in America, it's a tax-free donation. Just so you'll know, tax deductible, not tax-free, tax deductible. And for $35 a month, you also get four, 35 or more. <laughs> you can give more. You get four gifts a year. And they're pretty nice gifts, by the way. It's not, uh, as I noted earlier, a Cracker Jacks bo box. So go to PragerU.com and please donate. And I'll tell you something about donating. Very few people wake up in the morning and think, ah, another day to give away money. Okay? That's not normal. I don't. And I try to give a substantial amount to charity. But once you give it, literally the moment you feel good about yourself. It's a fascinating thing how I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. Ah, now I feel good. That's what happens. Okay, so the purpose of the Fireside Chat is simply for me to offer you some thoughts spontaneously. None of this is rehearsed. And then take your questions. So I decided to address a very uh, controversial issue uh, about the uh, about Ukraine, Russia, but the bigger issue of what what America should intervene in and what not to, and even bigger than that, I'll begin with the bigger than that. So I I have made the case you can see it twice, a PragerU video by Brett Stephens of the New York Times, and a column by me from eight years ago, I believe it is. Defending the idea that America should be the world's policeman. So I begin with the question, does the world need a policeman? And the answer is pretty self-evident. Do cities need policemen? Everybody, except perhaps the woke, would say yes. So if cities need policemen, why do they need policemen? To protect the innocent against criminals. Why wouldn't the world need a policeman for the same reason? To protect innocent countries against criminal countries. I've never gotten a coherent response to that. We'll leave America out for a moment. Just in principle, is it clear that the world needs a policeman just as much as any city needs a policeman? So now question number two. What happens if there's no policeman? Same thing that would happen in a city. There would be mass murder. That's what would happen in the world. Mass murder. Number three, who should be that policeman? So, since the world needs a policeman, there would be horrific consequences if there were none. Who should be it? The United States has been the world's policeman, basically, since World War II. It's a long time ago. What are we talking about? Almost 80 years. And it hasn't always worked out, but my view is things would have been a lot worse without America. Here, here's an example, which nobody thinks about, or very few people think about. So the U.S. has troops in a lot of countries. Uh, those who were against the use of American troops... Are you against, for example, troops in South Korea? Every American 
should read about the Korean War. That was as pure an act of goodness as any war America or anybody else has ever fought. We defended people we knew nothing about. Most Americans could not identify Korea on the map. But they went and 37,000 Americans died defending free Koreans from communist Koreans. What is the result? Do you know how horrible, how evil it's, uh, North Korea is? How primitive? Do you know that if you look at a satellite picture of the Korean peninsula, you know exactly, uh, if you take it at night, you know exactly where the boundary is? Because North Korea is dark and South Korea is all lit up. That's how little electricity they even have. North Korea is a primitive, vile, cruel concentration camp. That's basically what it is. It's a large concentration camp. I had uh, in this very room a North Korean defector, a woman who got out at 13 years of age. And that was one of the most memorable interviews of a life of interviewing that I have done. Yan Min, right? What was her, what's her last name? Yan Mi Park. Park, right. Yan Min Park. She, she was sex trafficked when she got to China at 13. And, and yet, did you, did you see her disposition, her happy disposition? But she describes life in North Korea, which I happen to know very well because I studied communist countries and I met with the defectors from North Korea many, many years ago in South Korea and uh, in, uh, let's see, and in other parts of Asia. Anyway, we saved South Korea from torture, from spectacular tyranny. Our troops are still there. Our troops are still in Germany. That was to protect Europe against an invasion by the communists of the Soviet Union. We have troops in Japan. Has Japan flourished? Has Germany flourished? Has South Korea flourished? You use a Samsung phone? You drive a Korean car? Who would have imagined that? You know how poor it was? I was in South Korea as, as a kid in the 70s. It was so poor. If somebody would have said to me, well, you'll be using South Korean technology in a, f in a few decades. They, they, they will rival American and German and Japanese technology. I would have said, please, I can't conceive of it. All because of America. These countries have thrived because of American troops. Afghanistan, we should never have left. We lost almost no soldiers in the last few years in Afghanistan. But very, very, very gradually, women were allowed to study. Women were allowed to be in professions. People were allowed to speak their minds. And that all died when we left. Why did we leave? Because we're tired of being in a place 20 years? But wait a minute. I just told you. We're, we're in Korea for 70 years. We're in, uh, in Japan for more than that, and in Germany. I don't understand why there's a statute of limitations. So you say, well, why should America take on this burden? Don't we have troubles in our own country? Yes, we do. But the troubles in our country would not go away if we were not helping these other countries. We have an open border bringing in millions of people in illegally each year because ha the half of the political parties of this country, namely the Democratic Party, want it that way. They want open borders. They think that the more people who come in, the more Democrats there will be. That has nothing to do with whether we have troops abroad. COVID has nothing to do with whether we have troops abroad. What American problem would be lessened if America withdrew from the world? I can't think of one. Anyway, there were people who opposed the fighting World War II. Oh, we got troubles in America. You could say that at any time. We were in Afghanistan. We should not have left. Uh, the, uh, the, the horrible people are taking over Afghanistan. 
It was not great while we were there, but it was better than it is. Should we have gone into Iraq? Well, to, by the way, you, you, there's no way you would know this, but I did not advocate going into Iraq. Uh, I, I remember going when, when MSNBC would, would actually invite me. I remember going on hardball and, and shocking the host that I was not in favor of going in. I'd like to dig up that uh, video to be able to prove it. Once we were in, I was gung-ho on winning. We were fighting really horrific human beings. The Islamists who wanted to take over Iraq. But anyway, we, we went in. And uh, is Iraq better or worse for our going in? Literally only God knows. If you read what Saddam Hussein did to his people and did to others when he could, it's a tough call. I admit it, it's a tough call. Being the world's policeman doesn't mean you go everywhere. But the notion that we only go when America's interests are directly threatened, what does that mean? Does it mean only if America is attacked? So we, we allow horrible actors to take over countries because they didn't attack us? Hasn't the lesson of the world been when you allow aggression, somehow it metastasizes and it gets worse? And if you don't stop it in the beginning, you have more and more countries gobbled up? That was the lesson with Hitler. They, the people argued the same thing. Let's just do what's good for Britain. No more war. They were sick of war after World War I, much sicker than we are after Afghanistan. The numbers they lost dwarfed the numbers we lost in Afghanistan. So there's the argument that it's the military-industrial complex that's pushing for a confrontation with Russia. By the way, I'm not for American troops fighting Russian troops, but I'm not for America doing nothing. We should do whatever is possible, including supplying them with weapons, including having troops in, in other places, like perhaps guarding the Baltics. But in any event, I admit, I, a lot of conservatives say, oh, only if America is threatened. But it's an odd notion. How do you know when America is threatened? Is it only if New York or San Francisco is attacked? I don't think so. I also, I also think in moral terms. If you're the richest man in the block, you should give charity. If you're the strongest man in the block, you should protect the weak. I do believe that. I don't know why I have to defend that belief among conservatives, many of whom are religious. Do not the strong have an obligation to the persecuted weak? Whether you think God or luck gave America all this strength, do, do you really believe that we shouldn't use it except for us? Anyway, that's not my view. Okay. I thought I'd share that with you. Oh, Kadoki. Question from you folks. We always begin with a video question. Hi, Dennis. My name's Noel. I'm 22 and I'm from Los Angeles, California. And my question is, what advice would you have for young conservatives who are afraid to speak out in their beliefs because they fear retaliation from others? Okay. That is a very good question. And uh, what was her name, Noel? Well, I know I've dealt with this, but it doesn't matter. I could deal with it every week, and it wouldn't be too much. This is not a question for young people alone. This question will plague you for the rest of your life. What risks do you take to your, for yourself to do what is right? Now, there are times when the risks are so horrible, if you knew if you'd speak out, you would be shot. I wouldn't advocate that you speak out now. But you're not going to be shot. You'll lose friends. You'll be attacked on social media. And 
I guess the best example I could give is this young woman that I, I have had on my radio show who had this exact dilemma. She went from liberal to conservative. Interestingly, after reading my book, Still the Best Hope. I don't mention that book often, but if you want to understand the left and America and Islam, those are three books in one, Still, Still the Best Hope. But deeply affected her. She wrote me a letter. By chance, I happened to see it. And then she watched PragerU videos, and it reinforced her conviction that she was no longer on the left. So she came to, my, to, to visit my show, and I asked her, would you like to come on the show and, and talk about why you went from left to right. And I said, look, I just want you to know that you'll, you'll, you'll probably lose some friends. You'll be attacked at your college. In her case, it's Harvard. And I, I can't tell you what to do, but I do want you to know that you will pay a price if you come on my show. And I'll never forget, she said, uh, I'd like to talk to my mom. I thought it was very, very sweet, actually. So she left my studio to speak. I continued my show. She walked back in during the next commercial break, and she said, I'm coming on. So she came on, spoke about it, and sure enough, a few months later, I had her on again. I said, how did it go after you, you came on my show? She said, I had two weeks of hell. Those were her words. Friends from, from elementary school dropped me. I was attacked at college. And I said, and then what happened? I said, then I went into heaven. I said, really? And why is that? And she said, well, and this is what I remember, not in this order necessarily, but I remember. One thing she said is, I sleep better. And of course you'll sleep better. When you don't hide who you are, you sleep better. That's just a fact. And she said she was rewarded. I said, how was that? She said, I met all these people that were kindred spirits who came out. When I left the closet, people like me found me. People who share my values found me. But if you're in the closet, you can't be found. Isn't that important? So you will bring wonderful people into your life by speaking out. If you don't speak out, nobody knows who, who, who you are to, to befriend you. So you'll have friends that you have to hide yourself from versus friends that you could be completely yourself with. Doesn't that sound great? But you will pay a price. It is not possible to go through life doing what is right and not pay a price. No society has ever been that wonderful, that good, that just speaking out on behalf of good doesn't mean you pay a price. That's heaven. In heaven, goodness is self-rewarding. So I hope that gives you a clue as to what I would advise. Question from Kezia, 28 years old, in Manado, Indonesia. Hi, Mr. Prager. Hope you're well. I am. I love to listen to your fireside chat podcast every day while driving to and from work. Thank you. How big a listenership and viewership do I have in Manado? That would be fun. Yeah. Get a PragerU license and see how many people go. Thumbs up. Anyway, my question is, do you believe God makes specific intervention in our life if we pray and ask him to? I always have this discussion with my boyfriend, and he doesn't think so. But two weeks ago, you talked about God, quote, let, unquote, bad things happen sometimes. Please give us your insight thoughts. I love what you're doing. God bless you, your family, and prayer you team abundantly. Love from Indonesia. 
Well, my theology uh, in, in a nutshell is God lets bad things happen and that I don't expect God to intervene on my behalf. I never did. And so uh, my preoccupation with God is what does God want from me rather than what do I want from God? And I think that's the healthiest view of God. It also produces the best person. A lot of people, I would say half of the people who believe in God, believe in a different God than I do. They believe in what I call a celestial butler. A, a, a butler, a, a housekeeper who's in, in the clouds, in the heavens. That's not my view. Does that mean you never pray? I, I never would say that. But I have, I have no expectations that God will intervene on my behalf. As I said, I am preoccupied with what God wants from me, not what I want from God. So that's my answer. Let me know what you and your boyfriend think. I think sometimes people take expectations as a confusion that you're saying that God will not do it. But you're just saying the way you Oh, right. No, I thank you for that. No, I would never say God won't do it. Yeah, I just don't expect him to do it. And you don't live your life with that. Right, I don't live with that expectation. That's correct. It may very well be that God will intervene. When I look back at my life, it's hard for me to think that God has never intervened. But it's looking back, not looking forward. That's a different story. But nevertheless, I have always been more preoccupied with what God wants from me. And I, I, I think that that's healthier. I think it's truer to God's will. And you'll lead a better life. Henry, 15, Vancouver, Washington. Dear Dennis, Megan, Megan's baby, Nathan, a.k.a. Nate the Great, Forrest, Otto, Snoopy, and if he is still there, Peanut. He, he goes back far and in the future as well. <laughs> That's true. I have seen every, he's 15 years old. I have seen every last one of your fireside chats to date. And here is my question. If you could give an 11th commandment, what would it be and why? Well, you know, my, my, fundamental belief is that it is should be the mission of every Jew and Christian to bring the world to the Ten Commandments. That That's my be deepest belief. So I, I, I have millions, tens of millions of views, I think, on the Ten Commandments at PragerU. I, I would hope everybody watching this would watch all of them. There are 11 videos. One introduction and the Ten Commandments, each one with its own video. When I have taught it, that has always been a question. So if there were an 11th commandment, what would you like it to be? So I will disappoint you, something I have done often in my life. Uh, I don't have an answer. Which is a testimony to how spectacular I think the Ten Commandments are. I mean, look, I would be prepared to say, do not drive slowly in the left lane. I, I would nominate that as a, an 11th commandment, but most people would think I'm kidding. <laughs> Whereas I'm only half kidding. <laughs> uh I have asked audiences, okay, since you asked me, I'll ask you, raise your hand, what would you like the 11th commandment to be if there were one? Do you know what the most common answer I get is? Uh, honor or respect your child. That is often, or your children. And I, I find that fascinating 
that people think about that so much. I have always understood honor your father and mother as a commandment implying you need to be honorable. You, the parent, must think of yourself as uh, as being honor worthy. So it's sort of included to my mind in honor your father and mother. But uh, look, th- it's a problem. The com- that's a problem in and of itself. Parents' duty is is to give their children moral guardrails. It is, that's how you honor your child. I mean, if there was going to be an 11th commandment about children, it should be give your children moral guidelines and, and guardrails. That, that to me would be more, uh, more fitting. But I, I actually think the 10 are pretty, pretty darn good. Uh, as I have said now on a number of occasions... You really want to defund the police? I have a way. Have everybody obey the Ten Commandments. Then you can defund the police. That's all it takes. There are just ten of them. Okay. We can move on then. Another, a 13-year-old, Owen in Woodenville, Washington. I should talk to you once on why... I believe so many young people watch the Fireside Chat, and for that matter, many of the videos, but especially the Fireside Chat. Maybe I'll I'll even mention that. I think I'll talk about that now. And Owen, I'll take take your question next week. I I, want to comment that he was a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old. This is common. And when I walk through the airports and there are families, the, the kids... Are, are, are even more excited than the parents to meet me. And I, I don't talk in any way down. I don't lower the intellectual level or my vocabulary for 13-year-olds when I give these fireside chats. So why are 13-year-olds watching? Isn't that an interesting question? Oh, I've thought it through. So I've, I, I'll end with uh, this fireside chat with some thoughts on this. You learn a lot about yourself, or you should, as you get older, right? I mean, that's a cliche. So here's something I learned about me very early on. I began lecturing publicly at the age of 21, after I came back from the Soviet Union. So I remember when I was about, I don't know, 25 years old, I was giving a a lecture. I remember it it, it was in a synagogue. And generally speaking, in synagogues, in the in most cases, when the rabbi speaks, a lot of the kids walk out. <laughs> they just leave, and they they play, you know, some 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 game outside or something, some games. Anyway, uh, I remember seeing very young kids. I mean, much younger than thirteen, like ten. Eight, seated during my speech and listening. And I remember thinking while speaking, holy crow, that kid's listening. And then after the talk, I thought about it a lot. Why are kids listening to me? Oh, Otto, you good boy. Otto's not listening to me, I will say. Why are kids listening to me? And then I, I thought, I, I, I'm a systematic thinker. So I thought, why is that? Why is that? Why is that? He's good. And I came up with the following. Number one, if you are clear and interesting, you will hold a nine-year-old's interest. You have to be clear and you have to be interesting. Exactly what you have to be for adults. That's the irony. It's why, why do kids get bored? Because most speakers, they get bored quicker than adults. 
adults give speakers more of, of a chance, as it were. It, it's, it's not conscious, but they do. Or they tune out and then come back. Kids, if they tune out, it's lost. They don't come back. So I realized the importance of clarity and interest in speaking. And that's why I think kids watch this. It's not self-praise. I, uh, it's just a fact. I'm clear and I'm interesting. And I have, and I have something to say. The, so the same rule applies for an 80-year-old as to an 8-year-old. That's the irony. Most teachers are not clear are not interesting, and don't have anything important to say. So kids are bored out of their minds in schools. It's not an attack on teachers. It's just a fact. You all went to school. That's true for college as just as much as it is for, for elementary school. And I remember thinking in college, I'll never forget when I had a, a particularly boring teacher, or in high school, actually high school, and I remember thinking, does he find himself interesting? <laughs> Is he keeping his own interest? Is he holding his own interest? Does he think he's interesting? I never got an answer to that. So I wouldn't want to insult the person. I never asked him or her. Do you think you're interesting? But that's very important. That is the key, by the way, to all communication. All music is where I discovered it, but I've always known it subconsciously with regard to speaking and writing. And I have a way of doing it in both that I ought to talk about another time, and I will. Anyway, on behalf of Otto and all the other people and arms and babies yet to come, thanks for watching. See you next week. Thank you for watching this video. To keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation.